Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I want to turn your attention for announcements. You can find them in the messenger. And uh, just some up upcoming things. We are uh, looking at our stewardship themes each week. Um, so after I'm, I've uh, done an opening prayer, I'm, we'll watch a video, and Marissa will talk about our theme this week, Facing the Truth. And uh, keep in mind, our commitment weekend is November 11th and 12th, and uh, there'll be a breakfast between services on the 12th. Lots of upcoming events, so please read through this. I think one just for uh, dates and awareness, I will be gone uh, November, November, October 13th through the 27th. I'll be in uh, my home state of Minnesota. The first week, I'll be doing an intensive course at Luther Seminary. And when I say intensive, I mean it starts at 8 a.m. and it ends at 8.30, so please pray for me. <laughs> and then on uh, the next week, I'll uh, finally get some time with my family and um, have a little home time. So I'll be back for Reformation weekend, um, the 28th and 29th. So the next two weekends, you'll have guest ministers, and it will be your very own John Rosvigera right over there for next weekend, and the weekend after that will be Pastor Ruth Drews, and she is a pastor. She pastored many years in Connecticut, has moved to Springfield this summer, has been attending our 830 worship service, so I'm excited for her to um, have a, a part in leading worship here as uh, a pastor. So with that, let's have a prayer. Good and gracious God, we come today carrying the weight of the world. It's been a weighty week, and uh, we've, our minds are filled with images of uh, shock and violence this week, and, and we just bring those things that weary our soul and lay them at your cross, that you may take them upon yourself, that we may rise renewed, refreshed, that we may glorify you and praise you because of this amazing gift you give us to find sanctuary and then go forth and be Christ to others. Amen. And let's have this uh, film. The urban myth goes like this. Farm life is simple living. Jim Johnson is a member of Grace Lutheran Church in Knoxville, Illinois. According to Jim, agribusiness is not simple. High-tech GPS-equipped combines, volatile fuel, fertilizer, and grain prices have modern farmers like Jim performing a juggling act. Helping to feed the world adds meaning to Jim's life. He shares the workload with neighbors, lives within his means, and has a strong faith in God in times of abundance and in times of want. Yet, Jim struggles with what it means to have faith in God and live simply. I'm a farmer. I, I farm. I sell seed. Uh, do a little custom work for other farmers. Uh, my, and my wife teaches school, and that's pretty much what we do. Wheat's kind of a crop that can deteriorate pretty quick. We had some cool weather in the spring, so it's everything's kind of set back a little bit. We had a lot of wet weather, but it's ready now. And if you you know don't get it now and get a couple of rains on it or something, it can it can be a real problem. You start losing test weight. You get a lot of docks. When you're farming, it's not you don't have any money coming in, but <laughs> you have a lot of bills to pay and bank notes to pay back and things that you know you've borrowed for expenses and. And then if you don't have a very good crop, then it doesn't make a lot of difference what the price per bushel is. If you don't have anything to sell, you're not going to have any money. 
Well, I think when they go good, you need to realize that maybe they won't down the road in a year or two. So you don't get too wild. You don't go out and spend a bunch of money just betting on the, the fact that you think it might be continue to be good. So you don't spend money you don't have yet. You don't want to skimp on fertilizer or seed or things that will cost you in the, in the long run. But you can watch some costs and do some things that uh, make it easier to survive. It's all about raising a good crop and, and being able to sell it and make a profit. And Tom and I share our workload in the spring. We're both laid back enough that it works out. No, we're not hyper and we don't have to have everything our way all the time. So it works out pretty well. But you've got to be able to give and take and do a little, a little of those things. And, and what you get out of it is uh, obviously, you know, we can keep our expenses down a little bit more on the, on the business side of things, but it gives you a relationship with somebody that you, you kind of watch who you partner with. I'm not going to be in, in, in a partnership with somebody that I don't trust or, or we don't get along, but uh, it works well for us. Simplicity would be great, but I don't see how that I can do that and compete with the way we need to do things now. Uh, simplicity means, you know, to me that go back to simpler times and you, you know, spend less money and don't spend as much on your crop and live simpler, but we don't live in that kind of a world now, so we kind of have to adapt, I think. And, uh, it's simplicity to me, you know, means less stress. Well, so maybe you don't buy as many things as you think you have to have and don't borrow as much money and don't have to, the stress of having to worry about how to pay it back. And, we don't live simply. We have every, all the toys and gadgets and all the things. But when my wife and I first got married and when we had little kids and, you know, I still remember when we go to church on Sunday, we were struggling to make ends meet and I had to check my wallet to see if I had $10 to go out to lunch at McDonald's after church. If you're lucky and you're, you're a farmer, maybe you have 40 crops, you know. I don't see how you could be a farmer and, and not believe in God. You've got to have faith to do this. You've got to have, if you go out and plant those seeds in the ground, you got to realize that there's a bigger force than just you and me that we need to depend on. And I don't think without God, you know, we, we can't do this. Marissa Weaver, and I'm a member here at Messiah Lutheran and part of the Stewardship Committee. And over the next few weeks, we're sharing these videos and talking about our theme um, of Make It Simple. And we're really just encouraging you to find ways to give your time, talent, or treasure to not only the congregation, but also the community. So as we heard from Jim in the video, you know, he talked about sometimes it doesn't feel realistic to live simply. And we feel pulled and pushed by different forces. And I know sometimes I feel overwhelmed. I don't know if anybody else is. Um, so in Mark chapter 4, we read, A great windstorm that arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he, but he, Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up to say to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the seas, Peace, be still. So as you're wrestling with what does this theme mean and how can I do more, but yet I'm feeling overwhelmed, um, we encourage you to really just look at your daily life and focus instead on what God provides and listen. And so, you know, maybe later today, if you can take some time to be still and reflect on how using your time, your talent, or your treasure to serve both our congregation or our community over the next few weeks and into the next year, uh, because we need you. Thank you.
Living together in trust and hope, we proclaim our faith. We believe in one God, the mighty maker of creation, both apparent and hidden. We believe in Jesus the Christ, the word of God in human form. He is our teacher and our salvation. After being crucified, he rose from the dead and ascended to the Father. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, strength, and wisdom, the love between the Father and the Son. We believe in the resurrection of our Lord, in his holy church, and in the power of the baptism. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God of overflowing grace, forgive us for shallow thankfulness. Forgive us for passing by the ones in need. Forgive us for setting our hopes on fleeting treasures. Forgive us our neglect and thoughtlessness. Bring us home from the wilderness of sin and strengthen us to serve you. In all that we say through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now receive this forgiveness of our sins, this promise of second chances, that we are given this opportunity to be renewed, refreshed, and to live out our being in Christ. Amen.
The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. Jesus said to the people, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenant seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put the wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants, who will give him the produce of the harvest time. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone that the builders reject has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people that produce the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please take this time to share peace with one another. So I'm going to invite the kids to come forward and have a little children's time. Come on up. It's your birthday? Happy birthday. Wow. I know, it's smoky. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's a big birthday day. Lots of people. Two birthdays. Wow. And you got a loose tooth. We got one missing right there. Yeah, yeah. Wow, you got big stuff going on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Is that a rule that you lose teeth in first grade? Is everybody rule? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, I just have a really short message today. Have you guys ever played checkers? You guys know the game checkers? Yep, okay. So checkers has two different colored pieces, right? What are the colors? Black and red. Black and red. Black and red. Yep, and on a board, the board's got different colors too, right? And they're like squares, and you move them to the to the square, if you, if you and you can't move them in the other square. You get king. king. Mhm. Then it can go forward and backwards. Yeah, you yep. Go and backwards. Well, can you play checkers if you only have black checkers, no. or if you only have red checkers? No. no, you need both. You need the black and the red checkers. 
Yeah, well, you could change. Yeah, you could have them in different colors, but you need two different colors, right? That's kind of the key thing to playing checkers, right? Well, there's a word that was in the scripture today, and it's cornerstone, and that's kind of a weird word. We don't really use that much. Basically, what it is is that it's a key item, key thing to our faith, and Jesus is the key item, key cornerstone. Don't have our faith if we don't have Jesus. So um, that is basically what a cornerstone is. It's essential for our faith. So Jesus is essential for our faith, just like you need to have red and black checkers to play checkers. All right, that's basically all the message is, is that Jesus is the key message. Let's pray quick before you go to, all right? Yeah. Okay. Dear Jesus, we know you are important. And we thank you for helping our faith. And giving us hope when we feel hopeless. Amen. All right. So today I want to start the sermon a little differently. Um, I'm going to start with a poem, okay? And this poem's called, God, Thou Art Love, and it's by Robert Browning, great poet. Here's how it goes. If I forget, yet God remembers. If these hands of mine cease from their clinging, yet the hands divine hold me so firmly that I cannot fall. And if sometimes I am too tired to call for him to help me, then he reads the prayer unspoken in my heart and lifts my care. I dare not fear, since certainly I know that I am in God's keeping, shielded so from all that else would harm. And in the hour of stern temptation, strengthened by his power. I tread no path in life to him unknown. I lift no burden, bear no pain alone. My soul a calm, sure hiding place has found. The everlasting arms my life surround. God, thou art love. I build my life on that. I know thee, who has kept my path and made light for me in the darkness, tempering sorrow so that it reached me like a solemn joy. It were too strange that I should doubt thy love. This poem, God, Thou Art Love, by Robert Browning, it speaks about the trust that we place in God's love. There's comfort for our souls. And that's really good news because <laughs> the text from Matthew today is one that it cannot be preached without discomfort. It shares a violent word. And in a week in which there has been great violence, Violence that has ripped our paper-thin sense of comfort to shreds. Here in the sanctuary, we take respite from the world. We find sanctuary, and we also consider, who is it that Christ is calling us to be in this world? The parable today, it comes at a time at the end of Jesus' journey and ministry. 
By this time in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus has ridden into Jerusalem, being welcomed with hosannas and waving palms. He has overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple and caused a great ruckus. He's told his disciples multiple times that he will die on a cross in Jerusalem and rise three days later. And now he is teaching in the temple, debating with chief priests and Pharisees in parable after parable. And the tension is rising. So he tells this story of some misbehaving tenants and a landowner who plants a vineyard, builds a watchtower and a wall and a wine press and prepares for this, this wonderful place to grow his vines. And anyone listening at this time in this place would have recognized the scripture he was quoting from, that he was alluding to the story in Isaiah 5. In Isaiah 5, characters are very clearly defined. God is the owner of the vineyard. The plants are the best vines. Um, This vineyard owner has lovingly uh, dug up the soil, cleared out the rocks. The watchtower has been built to guard and protect the vines. The wine vat has been constructed to make wine from the fruit of the harvest. The vineyard is Israel. The planting is Judah. And despite the owner's loving care, only wild grapes are found in his vineyard. So that's the story people are thinking of when Jesus starts his story, his parable. In Jesus' parable, there's the same kind of loving care depicted, right? The landowner is, is uh, taking great care to build this beautiful, beautiful vineyard. And the landowner leases the vineyard to tenants to care for the vines and bear grapes in the harvest. From planting to harvest, it, it takes about five years, so the, the landlord leaves and the landowner is a, is a good landowner, but the tenants, hmm, maybe not so good, defiant. See, they won't pay the landowner the rent that was agreed upon, the harvest. The tenants want the vineyard to belong to them. When the servants and the son of the landowner come to gather the rent and collect the harvest, they challenge that idea. They don't like it. The vineyard doesn't belong to them, but they refuse to believe it. You see, this vineyard gave them their identity. It's how they knew themselves. And without it, or to have part of it taken from them, was threatening. So I have a question. What do you hold dear? If it was challenged or removed from you, would you feel threatened or react defensively? See, we say things are of are ours, our ownership of. We say things like, my family, my job, my body, my church. We're possessive about these things. But do you ever think how strange a concept that really is? We don't own or have control over our family or our job, or our bodies, or even our church. These are foolish sources of identity, misplaced senses of ownership. 
The good news in this story is that the landowner still wants to be in a relationship with these mistaken tenants, us. Unlike the conclusion of Isaiah 5, which ends with total destruction of the rebellious vineyards, wiped out. There is no wrath given here in Jesus' parable in this story, except the assumption of the Pharisees. But Jesus does not share a story of wrath being done. So our identity, it comes from not the vineyard that we think is ours, but from the landowner who trusts the tenants, despite their track record, to care for what is entrusted to them. Maybe a way to understand this was a discovery a farmer made once. It was a man who was losing his dairy farm, and he struggled with the question of identity. What was his true source of identity? He had been a dairy farmer for 25 years. It had been the family farm for three generations, and to lose the farm, to declare bankruptcy, to sell the land and the homestead, to sell the cows, it just crushed him. Who was he if he was not a dairy farmer? So he talked with his pastor, with friends at church and in the community, and he studied the Bible, and he prayed, and he grieved his loss of identity, and he learned through this process, this digging deep process, that placing his identity, his sense of worth and value on what he did or the farm that he owned was truly foolish. That first and foremost, his identity was sourced and and bound in not the thought of what he owned, but in whose I am. Whose am I? He was a child of God, an image of God, and whatever job that he had or whatever he thought he owned were only secondary. Those were gifts, gifts that he cared for. But they were not his identity. Who he was, first and foremost, was a child of God, and the identity of child of God was not going to change. That God was faithful to him no matter what he did in the future, that God would be with him in that journey till the end. So consider that, and now consider the landowner in our story, the image of God, the creator, if you haven't figured that out. First, he sends servants. They're beaten, they're stoned, and they're killed. And then he sends more. Not the police, mind you, or the army. He sends more servants. And the same thing happens again. So he sends his son, the heir, alone, unarmed, to meet with these violent hooligans. And really, this is an absolutely crazy plan he has. But key to understanding this plan is what it's based on. See, in our world, we tend to respond as the Pharisees do. We react to violence with violence. But the landowner reacts to violence with vulnerability. By human standards, we deserve God's wrath, just as the Pharisees assumed But God responds to violence with vulnerable love. Anger is reprocessed into grace and implies forgiveness for those willing to accept the offer of love. So here's a question. How do you let God love you? How do you let God love you? For God is crazily in love with us and will go to any lengths, even dying on a cross and a resurrection from the grave, to show us that. 
so consider. God, thou art love. I build my faith on that. I know thee who has kept my path, made light for me in the darkness, tempering sorrow so that it reached me like a solemn joy. That tempering sorrow so that it reached me as a solemn joy. It were too strange that I should doubt thy love. O God, thou art love. I build my faith on that. Amen.
Oh God, too often when we turn on our phones, TVs, and computers, we are met with news of yet another mass shooting. These tragic outbreaks of violence remind us that we live in a lost and broken world. But as people of faith, we know that this broken world is also so loved by God. We pray that our churches and all churches across the world will continue to see, be seen as places of refuge, of love, and of hope, rather than places of fear. We seek your guidance, God, as we try to make sense of these tragedies and respond as Christ would. We pray for the future of our nation and for our integrated life together. So as we mourn for those affected by these tragedies, we pray these words. Lord, in our shock and confusion, we come before you in our grief and despair in the midst of hate. In our sense of helplessness in the face of violence, we lean on you. For the families of those who have been killed, we pray. For the shooters, help us to pray, Lord. For the communities that have lost members, their anger, grief, and fear, we pray. For the churches striving to be our light in darkness beyond our comprehension, we pray. In the face of hatred, may we claim love, Lord. May we love those far off and those near. May we love those who are strangers and those who are friends. May we love those who we agree with and understand, and even more so, Lord, may we, those, may we love those who we consider to be our enemies. Kyrie eleison, Lord, have mercy. Heal our sin sick souls. Make these wounds whole, Lord. We pray for those who are grieving now. We pray prayers of sympathy for the friends and family of Linda Binder. We pray for healing and wholeness upon Lynn Starr, Ron Fells, Wayne Biggs, Oliver Bartelt, uh, Wayne, Matt Henry, Father Bob Binta, and Myrna Parker. Lord, we pray all these things that you may make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. And where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, and to love as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. We gather now to remember this meal that Jesus has given us. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do so remembering Christ died, Christ risen, and Christ shall come again. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom. Teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin. You may be seated. All are welcome to receive this meal of forgiveness. We will commune by intinction. There will be two stations, one on this side and one on this side. You can come forward. You'll receive the bread. You may dip it in the red liquid, which is wine, or the white liquid, which is grape juice, and then take your seat. So you'll be communing while standing. Come, let us eat.
Please stand as you are able. Receive the blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And now may the power of God strengthen you. May the love of God heal you. And may the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you now and forever. Amen.